Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this new webinar of HESI's Environmental Epidemiology Committee webinar series. I'm Sandrine Deglin, and I'm a Senior Scientific Program Manager with HESI and the manager of the EPI Committee here at HESI. And uh, with me today are Mr. David Miller and Dr. Igor Borstin. Uh, they are two of our committee co-chairs and they will moderate the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. So today's webinar will be presented by Professor Frank De Voort from Bristol University in the UK. Professor De Voort will be telling us all about the value of natural experiments in the study of causal inference. But before we start, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background on the EPI committee and what we've been working on uh, more recently. So the mission of the committee is to foster the use of epidemiological data in human health risk assessment. And um, last summer, we published that paper that you can see here on the right in Global Epidemiology. And so this paper highlights the key needs that should be addressed to increase the use of epidemiological data in risk assessment. It also identifies some actionable steps uh, that could be taken to make progress in that space, as well as uh, who the actors of change could be in uh, what we believe should be a collective effort. Um, another thing that we have, another iron in the fire, if I may say, is a, a survey that we disseminated or, and still are disseminating among risk assessors. So the goal of this survey is to have risk assessors tell us in their own words what they need to be able to better integrate epidemiological data in risk assessment. And if any of you would like the link to that survey, I would be happy to share it. Uh, it's also on the HESI LinkedIn page. Another thing is the uh, Epifora website. So this is a platform that came online uh, about a year ago now. And the reason why we designed that platform was to have a location on the web where we could compile information that was pertinent to both epidemiology and risk assessment. But most importantly, that platform hosts a database of, of experts or more generally individuals who are interested in this field. And so they can be exposure scientists or statisticians, epidemiologists, toxicologists, so not just risk assessors or epidemiologists. And uh, whether you have 40 years of experience in your field or you are a student, we encourage you to create a profile in that, in that database. Because what we're trying to accomplish with this is create a community of practice and build a, a network among professionals in these different fields to help them get in touch with each other because we have realized they are often siloed. So with that platform, we try to facilitate communication among the different fields and facilitate also collaboration or maybe uh, the finding of enter internships or mentorship. So I encourage you to, uh, to visit that uh, database and, and create a profile. Uh, it will only be successful if we have a lot of people joining. Now for today's webinar, um, I just want to um, add a little disclaimer to say that the views of the speakers are the views of the speakers, the speaker only, and not necessarily the views of HESI or the Environmental Epidemiology Committee or their members. In terms of logistics, just know that this webinar is being recorded and uh, we will share the link to the recording in the next in a couple of days after, after the presentation. If you have questions, which uh, we encourage you to, to do, to ask questions, you can type them in that control panel uh, and use specifically the question box. Do not use the chat box. So type your questions in the question box and um, um, our co-chairs will read the question to our speaker at the end of his presentation. Now, if you have any questions about HESI or about this EPI project, please contact me. You have my email address. And uh, for information about future webinars, or if you would like to propose a theme, or if you would like to propose a speaker, please contact me. Uh, you can also visit our uh, HESI website for more information. With that, I'm going to uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Borstin, who is going to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you, Sandrine. Uh, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Frank Duvok to this audience. Uh, Frank is currently Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at Bristol University in the United Kingdom. Uh, prior to that, he worked at the Center for Occupational Environmental Health at the University of Manchester, 
And before that, he did a tour of duty at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, Frank is originally trained in occupational environmental epidemiology and exposure and sciences at Wageningen University and Utrecht University and White Stu Universities. It's a long tail, uh, which we can save for another time. Uh, but uh, his main areas of interest are uh, how to best evaluate non-random public health interventions, as well as the questions of the impact of environmental factors of human health, in particular those related to ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Uh, he is a member of several national and international expert advisory committees on public health, environmental health, and radiation safety. And uh, we are very pleased that he's able to carve out time in his busy schedule. Um, I always like to say that Frank is the only person I know who, towards completion of his doctoral thesis, had enough material to defend two of them on entirely different topics, vaguely related. Uh, and he is also one of the most entertaining writers and commentators in the field that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. So you're in good hands uh, this morning, and I give the floor to Frank. Thank you very much for, for, for the invitation to do this um, presentation. So um, I'm a professor in public health uh, at the University of Bristol, and I work for two institutes, one the Bristol Medical School and one, one the NITR Applied Research Collaboration West. The reason I mentioned that is because quite a lot of my examples come from public health rather than environmental health. And um, I apologize for that, but I think um, it's it's there because it illustrates um, these yeah, important uh, uh, concepts a bit better than using environmental health. So this presentation is is just in a way to introduce natural experiment evaluations and to make everybody like aware what they are and how they can be used and where where there's a bit of an extra value in uh, in using them so so to to start thinking about and we start at the, at the at the top in a way at the basis and and i don't think i say anything new to anybody when i say that if we want to know whether an intervention works we we're generally told to use randomized experiments with a control group so an rct which is considered the uh, the gold standard uh, and the reason for that is that if it's randomized, then that kind of um, makes, in principle, makes both groups comparable in terms of, of both measured and unmeasured confounders. So you can then slit it into a potential outcomes framework, uh, assuming that if you have given the intervention to the other group, um, then you would have got the more or less the same result and at the very least the same, the same inference. Now, that's a, a good idea in principle, but it creates a couple of problems. Um, uh, for example, you can't actually do an RCT because how would you randomize building an, a new nuclear power station, for example, and evaluate its impact? The intervention may already have happened, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, in which case, um, you know, you, you can't do the randomization anymore. It's ethically dubious. Um, so if you're interested in the effect of an increase in air pollution, um, you could look at the reduction in air pollution, but what you re but that's the reverse of the question you, re you really want to know. So you'd have to increase local air pollution to to certain groups of the population, which which um, yeah you, it, is ethically not not really the right thing to do. Then there's the issue with RCTs um, that the results may be altered by participants' beliefs about the intentions and, and the hypothesis and that so-called demand effects that can, can color your outcomes of your RCT. And an important point is that, that RCT results are often not generalizable to the population, to specific to the context and the conditions of interest. So because that doesn't map, even though you have done the, the best study to get a certain causal estimate, you're still not sure whether that uh causal imp causal effect it is correct when once you start introducing your intervention or, or whatever it is you're interested in into the, the population of interest and there's another issue it's been labeled the causal wars um where it's argued that an rct is also a very convenient political tool um and the argument goes a bit like this if the art if it's considered the best tool for causal estimates and it's the only tool that can provide unbiased estimates of effect. It stands to reason that that only the evidence from RTC, RTCs, RCTs, is acceptable to 
inform any policy. Um, and as a result, you get arguments like there is insufficient high quality evidence to provide the basis for an exposure guideline or a lim limit value for, for insert any chemical or any other kind of exposure. And we need to wait until further high quality evidence becomes available. And that's an exclusionary policy that's been quite, quite successful and has prohibited the implementation of, of a lot of um, environmental policies. Um, even though we know that most of the evidence on health impacts from environmental and occupational exposures comes from observational studies. So there's a bit of a gap there. And, and ideally, uh, therefore, we, we'd like to explore the use of, of, of related methods with the potential for stronger inferences on causality than observational studies. Um, but that also lie outside of the constraints of the RCT. Um, and it's particularly important environmental health if it's to inform policy in a more useful way than a qualitative assessment on hazards leading to, to invoking a precautionary principle um, where it's not based on, yeah, on, but where it's based on a qualitative assessment rather than a, a quantitative exposure response association type thing. Um, so the natural experiment evaluation sits in this space, at least in theory, and, and often uh, a natural experiment evaluation is, is also called a quasi-experiment. So just to get the terminology straight, I'm using these two uh, terms at the same time. There may or may not be a, some small differences between them, but I'll, I'll discuss that a bit later. So if we look at what a natural experiment is, this is from the Dictionary of Epidemiology, and it, it talks about naturally occurring, circum, occurring circumstances with different levels of exposure. Uh, and the presence of persons in a particular group is typically non-random. I don't particularly buy into this definition. I find it a strange definition, and, and we'll get to why, why I believe that uh, in the next couple of slides. But, but this is one of the descriptions of a natural experiment and a way a lot of people will, I think, understand the natural experiment. And an example is that is, is, is uh, a natural cause and the, and the impact of that, um, so-called, uh, if you're religiously inclined, so-called an, an act of God. So, so an example of, of such a natural experiment evaluation is, is um, the 2011 earthquake in Christchurch in New Zealand. Um, it happened to be that that in that area um, there was a birth cohort with 35 years follow-up um, and a large proportion of that completed the mental health interview. The interesting thing is that 57% lived in the affected area but the other 43% uh, of that cohort had since moved out and lived elsewhere in Christchurch. So they compared these two populations and, and observed that, that as a result of the earthquake, there was a higher uh, rate of mental disorder in, in the population exposed to that earthquake compared to the controls. So what that does is it evaluates a change in exposure, which is one of the features of a natural experiment evaluation so that you can't mimic any other way other than to an RCT. Um, and it assumed that there's no structural reason that people have a move, have moved away from Christchurch and that the populations are comparable. That's called an as-if randomization, where it looks as if the, the, the intervention in, in, this, in this way um, has been randomly at, assigned to certain people, um, but because this wasn't done by, by researchers, it's, it's called as-if randomization. And we'll come to that concept a, a lot more in, in the future slides. So if we look at a standard overview of observational study designs um, that's generally used. The randomized control trial on the left is, is the gold standard we, we've, been met, we've been discussing. And then you've got your observational studies, so descriptive studies, cohort studies, case control, and cross-sectional studies. And the natural, natural experiment evaluation, quasi-randomized or non-randomized control trial, um, sits a, a little bit in between and sits uh, off the random allocation bit of the randomized controlled trial. So as a result, what that means is that these, these evaluations, these study designs, um, have both features of the RCT and of observational epidemiology. So they, they borrow strengths from each, and they, they also suffer from some of the limitations of each. But it's, 
but it tells you that 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 is like an intermediate study design that isn't used that often in, in a lot of um, environmental studies. So you don't necessarily have to have an act of God to look at this. You, you also have other examples of, of public health policy. And this is one of the most famous examples, if not the most famous example, of John Snow and the Broad Street Pump in London, um, where in, in the 18th century, the hypothesis was that cholera spread through contaminated water rather than uh, uh, through contaminated air. So the miasma theory, that was the competing theory. There were two companies and one of its companies um, moved its source upstream from London uh, so where the, the water was uncontaminated and, and the other company stayed um, downstream of London and, and this, this had a contaminated water source. Um, and the outcome of interest is the, is the cholera death of houses um, supplied by one company compared to the next. And, and you will see the same features of some kind of randomization and the feature of um, uh, a change in exposure that's being investigated. And this is the actual text from John Snow at the time. And it flags a few houses are supplied by one company and a few by the other, according to the decision of the owner or occupier. And a single house has, has a supply different from that on either side, and each company supplies both rich and poor. There's no difference either in the condition or the occupation of the people receiving the water of any of these companies. So John Snow's conclusion is that no experiment could have been devised which would more thoroughly test the effect of the water supply on the progress of cholera than, than this particular natural setting. Um, so the as if randomization here uh, is very good and you could consider this almost an, a randomized controlled trial. And um, well, we know how, in a way, we know how that story played out. So just to summarize, what sets natural experiments apart from standard observational studies? It's the as if randomization of, of the treatment or the exposure. Um, so it can be assumed that there's no systematic differences between the treated um, and the untreated group. That's in comparison to most observational studies. And it studies uh, the result of a change in exposure rather than just a variation in exposure. And this is a study design that's um, uh, embraced in a way by, by economists for quite a while. It's starting to move into um, public health a bit more and hopefully uh, uh, in environmental health as well because of, of its particular features. So the way to think about it is it's an, as an analytical approach. Um, basically, it's understood by the way it's, it's analyzed rather than its design. And it tells you that there's a, a couple of different statistical methods available. And if you do that, you do a natural experiment. Um, I don't particularly buy into that vision. I buy into the vision of the distinct study design. Uh, and I'll be discussing that in, in the next couple of slides. Um, this is all from a paper we've published, um, let's say two years ago, on conceptualization of natural and quasi experiments. And the link is in the bottom of the, the slide if you're interested. So if we first just flag the analytic approach, what I wanted to say, show you is just a set of the, the methods that can be used to analyze uh, natural experiment evaluations. And on the right, you see uh, um, some of the examples of, of what that looks in practice. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but what it basically shows you is that there is a particular point at which an exposure changes or a policy is implemented and as a result you have a change in some outcome of interest and you compare that to a control group or to a counterfactual situation um, and because of the assumptions you make and the design of, of, of a study um, and the way it's analyzed you can you can generally speaking interpret that change or that different that difference um, between the groups and before and after an intervention as a, as a causal effect. So that's all I want to say about the statistical method. So I don't have any equations at all in my presentation. I hope that's appreciated. Um, but what but what is it? What is a natural experiment evaluation done if we if we conceptualize it? And there's a, a couple of different closely related conceptual conceptualizations. And one is. Uh, it's a natural occurring event, 
uh, and otherwise, if it's an intervention or policy, it's a quasi-experiment. So that's the one copied from uh, uh, this particular book, but also from, from the Dictionary of Epidemiology. Somebody else, uh, 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 Dunning, who's done quite a lot of work in this area, uh, defines a natural experiment evaluation as one that's where the uh, exposure is uh, as if randomized and plaus very strongly um, plausibly as if randomized and otherwise he calls it a quasi experiment so there is a slight difference difference between the two then there's a third way of describing it um, where which is related to the intention of what's done so if something is naturally or planned uh, uh, planned it just occurs it's a natural experiment and otherwise if there wasn't an, an intervention to particularly change something it's called a, a quasi experiment and then there's different ways of signing that and then the medical research council in the uk in its guidelines for natural experiment evaluation doesn't bother with all the these kind of differentiations and says if it's um if it's an event or an uh, an intervention that's that's not controlled it's not fully randomized by 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 the research team um, then it's a natural experiment or a quasi experiment and you can either call them strong or or weak and and that's the most comprehensive in a way because you don't get a lot of uh, subgroups in there so to recap that the strength of a natural experiment is you can generate causal evidence uh, when RCTs are not possible. They have a very, they, they can have a high internal validity. They also have a, or can have a high external validity, uh, higher generally speaking than RCTs. And they, um, they can be done with routine data, which makes them fast, uh, low cost, and you can look at low term, uh, long term effects as well. The limitations are, 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 are are that it's not an RCT, so it has a higher risk of, of, of bias, at least in principle. Often they're discovered or 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 just found rather than actually planned. So so researchers find an intervention or a change in an exposure that they want to look at rather than, than planning that. Um, they they rely often on, on data being available, especially if you do uh, such an evaluation retrospectively. And there's issues with how well the intervention is is, is def defined, and in any case, it's it's less well defined what it is and who receives it compared to the randomized control trial. So the way you want to you can appraise those whether they um, whether you you do it you're looking at a good natural experiment evaluation is is proposed by Dunning and goes along three axes: the plausibility of as if randomization. The credibility of the of of the study and the relevance of the intervention or policy. So I won't be discussing the relevance, but I will have a quick look at the other two bits of the, of this and and give you some nice examples of, of why you want to think about these things. So the plausibility of safe randomization um, is where it's uh, well, it's, it's the randomization not controlled by researchers. I mentioned that um, the 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 clearer the case that that is happening the stronger the causal claims you can make um, it requires a variable that determine uh, treatment assignments are um, exogenous so so you can't have reverse causality for example and it can't be dependent on any other factor and and, and that's an argument you'd have to make and you can't always make that because you didn't as a researcher control the randomization so there's a what's called a continuum of plausibility. And it's very important to make a case when, when you do a natural experiment evaluation or right, when you appraise one of based on a lot of other information, how, how likely that assumption is. And you'd need empirical evidence to make that proof, but also a lot of domain knowledge. Um, and that's, that creates an additional layer of justification um, that requires, generally speaking, oh, um, the involvement of practitioners and the involvement of qualitative research methods, including process evaluations, to make to make a case how strong the the, the as if randomization is in in this particular study. So, so just to give an example of one that 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 has really strong 
passive randomization is one of the most well-known um, natural experiments. Um, and I suppose you know more about the, the context than I do of the, the American social health care program, but, but in early 2008, Oregon opened a waiting list for, for people uh, for on a low income um, who could be, uh, sorry, who could be part of the Medicaid program. And, and a lot more people signed up than, 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 than there were, was room. So, so the way to then assign that is to draw names or what they did was they drew names from a waiting list to fill the openings. And you could reasonably argue that that's, uh, that would have been random if it was only based on, on, on the names itself. So, so comparing the outcomes of, of the people who received uh, Medicaid to those that, that hadn't and were comparable, and it showed an increased use of healthcare services, decreased financial strain, and improved self-reported health and reduced rate of depressions, but it didn't have any effect or not measurable effect on physical health or on employment or, or earnings. So this is quite a, if you had done an RCT, you would have probably come up with the same results um, because of the way the, the treatment was or the, the program was, was assigned to people. Another uh, example fairly close to my, my heart is the, the because I'm from the Netherlands originally, it was the Dutch famine and um, or hunger winter uh, at the end of World War II, where um, part of the country was liberated and part of, and the last bit of the country was still occupied by the German forces. Um, and in occupied territory, the food rations dropped it to as low as 500 calories per day. So the, the exposed part of, the, of this famine was uh, in the west of the country and the unexposed was the north and the south of the country. Um, there's been quite a lot of studies on these populations um, because it, it, it enabled the study of the effects of famine on population health. And they had a particular interest in, in, in uh, children in utero at the time of, of the famine. So, so there's been loads of studies on this. And what's very interesting is because this relies on the fact that people in the West are, 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 are comparable to people in other parts of the Netherlands, which is quite, given the size of the country is quite, quite a reasonable assumption. So, so I won't talk into all the results. There's, there's lots of those that you can find in a, in a, in a book if you're interested and I've provided a link there. But what's interesting is that they looked at a similar kind of things uh, in studies of the Chinese famine during the Great Leap, Leap Forward and find very, very comparable results showing that, that you can get um, really good results that, the, that you would have, that would have given you, that would have been fairly similar had you done, been able to do an RCT in any of these kind of studies. But then I, I want to flag another one, a study I've, I've been involved in where we were interested in the closure of a two co-located alcohol premises, a restaurant and a cocktail bar that were closed in Bristol as a result of a license review uh, that suggested to, that crime and, and disorder were, were a bit too high. So we looked at time series in the local areas of antisocial behavior and crime and we, and we compared them to areas where our local practitioners from the council uh, said, you know, this these areas are comparable to, to the one where this, this, this premises is closed. We found very little evidence of impact, just as a general thing, but the, the reason I want to flag this is how comparable are the controls that were chosen, chosen, because we have no objective way of saying that. So this is a map of Bristol. Park Street on the bottom left is where that, th those, those places were closed, and the other areas were the control areas. And, and just from photos from the areas, they look quite comparable. Having lived in Bristol, I think they're quite comparable, but but I don't know for sure. And as there will be differences between them, so the as if randomization here is a lot less clear than in the other examples. Then to go to the next step, the credibility, which which is interesting in terms of um, does the investigation the investigative association make sense? Are there any other changes occurring at the same time that kind of explain it and and is there something is the parallel trend assumption something that's um that, that's been assessed and that holds and I'll, I'll flag that in a in, in a second as to what what that actually means uh, 
So just to go to the first thing, is it a plausible association? This is an, an industrial disaster in, the 1970, in 1976 in Italy of a chemical factory explosion resulting in the, the highest population level exposures to TCDD. And on the bottom right of, is a map where the black is where that happened. And then the gray areas are around it. That's uh, uh, zone B, so zone A is the very close proximity to that factory and zone C is the third one so further away and if you look at all circulatory diseases and I just picked this one out of out of all the results you see a very clear increase in um, in risk of circulatory disorders diseases in both men and women as a result of of that uh, that disaster and the reason I picked this one out is because it it's a very credible association because the, the, the levels in the population would have been low um, before that happened. So this, this is a post design. It's, it's a bit unclear whether it's controlled other than by another area. Um, and it's very, because there's no, if, so, so the reason to distinguish this from a, from a normal um, observational study is that it's comparable to an observational study because it's only looking at post um, accident data and the variation therein, but we can make the added assumption that the pre-accident levels were low or or non-existent. Um, and that seems a, a fairly reasonable assumption, um, and on that basis, it's a natural experiment evaluation. But what it what it ignores is that there has been no other sources of TCDD since, and I put a picture here of other pathways through which this can occur. Um, so, so, so it may well be that there's differences here that we uh, don't appreciate, but it's it's highly unlikely that they're as big as the differences uh, as a result of the explosion in that chemical plant. Now, this is another example where I seriously question the um, the credibility of the findings, and and that's why I wanted to show that. So it it looks at at the impact of a, a, a severe life event on, on perinatal outcomes. And this is related to um, the suicide bombing attacks in 2005 in London. And But the interesting thing is it doesn't look in London, which seems quite reasonable. Um, it looks in Manchester. And if you're not familiar with it, with England, this is not gonna help because the the, the both of the uh, the circles on that graph are on the wrong place. They're about, well, three centimeters too high. So the red circle, London, if you go straight down from that, you see London in the south. If you go the same amount down from the blue area, you come in Manchester, and you can see that that's actually really far away. So, as, so the claim is that as a result of um, the uh, bombings in London in the south, People pregnant on, on July 7 or be, people becoming or women becoming pregnant in the six months thereafter, compared to uh, a birth in the periods before and further away from that result, uh, from that incident, uh, would have uh, um, an impact on their on perinatal outcomes. And they claim that the, the difference they found was lowered by uh, a lower birth weight of 16 grams and an increased risk of small and very small for gestational age babies. I think that's highly unlikely given, given the event and given the difference between these areas. And if you compare that to the data from the Danish National Register, where they looked at um, close relative serious events, such as a death of a, of a parent or a partner, and you see that where, where the, the association is much more much more plausible and you see that that's 27 grams and this this starts to be a very questionable natural experiment evaluation the other thing is parallel trends and I, and I wanted to show another study that i've been involved in which is the the evaluation of is of a any public health impact from training local alcohol health champions to influence uh, the local alcohol environment and, and through that try and, and reduce um, health impacts and, and impacts on, on crime. Um, and we did that by, by various analysis of small geographical areas, 
and comparing those where that program was implemented with those where it wasn't implemented. I'll get back to this a bit later in my presentation, but <clears throat> the thing I wanted to flag is we had local control areas and national control areas. And on the left, you see the local control areas and you see that the um, intervention areas and control area timelines very nicely overlap, at least in temporal patterns, if not level, um, which makes it a lot more plausible that any effect that you see afterwards would be the result of um, of the intervention rather than something else because the time the time trends uh, converge over time and and if you look at the national control areas you see that the difference between those lines gets smaller over time which kind of implies that there's some other things going on that makes these time these time trends not parallel um, and so any inferences you can make from those comparison with national controls is 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 not as strong as as those from local controls and and that's what, what effectively the parallel trends is uh, and it's something to check with natural experiment evaluations another way of looking at that is if you look at public opinion and environmental politics as an example um this study looks at the causal effect of the fukushima daiichi accident on, on the public opinion about the effects of radiation in europe and it used it uses the uh, Euro uh, barometer data from 2010 and 2011. Um, it considers the treatment is, uh, as, is, as if random, and that makes sense because there's no reason there would be differences between populations before and after that accident. And the reason, and, and uh, sorry, and what they did find was, was a very small uh, increase in people uh, seeing the environment as a salient po uh, policy issue. Uh, and, and that effect is slightly larger in countries like Germany and France, where, where the issue of um, nuclear power stations, for example, and should they be used for, for, for energy uh, generation, uh, was a lot more actual than, than in, in other areas. Um, but the main point is they, close, they choose, chose these two points of, the, of, of that um, if that survey because they're closest to the nuclear accident and if you do that you minimize the impact of other events influencing the outcome variable and, and that's quite important and, and has an important um, thing in relation to um, uh, um, to whether you can assign the effect to the um, um, to the intervention itself so to this accident so I'll skip this slide because I wanted to just say something about now that we know how what natural experiment evaluations are and how they're used, I wanted to say something about our application in environmental health. So just give you an example because it's not that it's never used. These studies are used. And this is um, an example of the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Um, and then a condition was that, that the uh, uh, air quality would temporarily be temporarily be improved in Beijing and in this st study they looked at um, well over over 80,000 uh, term birth in, in various districts in, in Beijing and, and I, I put the figure here of the paper that shows you that the air pollution of various markers has gone down in 2008 and subsequently has gone up again after the Olympics and it shows that um, that slightly larger uh, uh, babies were born in, in in the year of the Olympics than in, in the years before and after, um, which gives you a very good effect of of, of the um, causal effect. And indeed, uh, it's consistent with effects with from um, non-natural experiments, uh, observational studies from exposure modeling, and with, with results from various um, meta analysis. There's another study um, which is quite interesting, where where they they were interested in the question of whether missing teeth cause cognitive early onset impairment, um, because evidence from from observational data suggests a strong association between the two. And you can use a natural experiment evaluation, and in particular an instrumental variable of the area implementation of um, water fluoridation. Um, which you can use as an instrumental va variable here, so so meaning that the the causal effect of water fluoridation only goes through uh, 
um, missing teeth, to effect on teeth, and has an effect on cognitive impairment. And if you do that, you can see that the fluoridation is strongly associated with fewer missing teeth. So that's the first step before a causal in, uh, for, an, um, for an IV. And then if you analyze, uh, the, if you use the, the instrumental variable of missing teeth predicted by probability of uh, fluoride exposure, it showed that missing teeth no longer was associated with cognitive impairment uh, and showing that the initial association between missing teeth and cognitive impairment was um, um, was confounded by, by unmeasured confounding. And they could do that because some areas uh, had the implementation of that water fluoridation and, and other areas didn't. It does rely on the strength of absence the strengths of the association of how, how good the IV is. And um, there is some data that the top arrow of, of fluoridation on cognitive impairment might, um, but that, that's assumed to not exist in an, in an IV, might, might in fact uh, exist at least to some degree in this association. So, so there's always these, these kind of issues to, to think about. And then one of my studies looked at uh, mobile phone use and uh, glioblastoma multiform, so a, a form of brain cancer, and compared it to counterfactuals. And they were they were constructed using um, basic structural time series models. I won't go into the details of those, but it's just a way of measure of of, of cal calculating counterfactuals for um, for time series um, and using a, a ten-year lag. I, I kind of showed that mobile phones were uh, very unlikely to have been an important putative factor. And if you look at the, the table here, you can see um, uh, what may be the, 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 well, it's basically the increase over time of, of various uh, brain cancer incidents of GBM uh, incidences. And then if you model the um, mobile phone use into this specifically at a country level, you see all these cumulative causal impacts de decrease. And the, cred the credible intervals all spanning unity, saying, well, actually, mobile phones explain most. Um, um, uh, mobile phones weren't an important factor to, uh, to do this. And if you look at the trends by different age groups, that kind of confirms it. So these are the, the results of these causal models. And, and you see that the effect, the access risk, it's quite, uh, uh, is, Gets gets higher, so there's no there's even a, a reduction in risk for for younger children, and then it models the the real trends quite well, up to about 65 years of age. So, so there is no correlation between the two. And then when you get older, when people get older, you see a, an increase in in risk, possibly associated, but uh, which weren't associated with mobile phones because because that. The explanation there is that that's more to do with better detection and um, uh, and better medical um, uh, um, medical scanning in a way of of uh, older people over time. Conceptual thing. I realized that it's getting a bit late, so I'll, I'll just quickly go through a conceptual thing of how you could use occupational cohorts in this case. In a, looking at use them in, using them in a different way, and this is only conceptually because I haven't actually done these analysis. But there's two cohorts of rubber manufacturing um, association workers in the UK, and, and rubber manufacturing is a group one um, uh, human carcinogen. Uh, one study um, covering workers from 1915 to 2000, um, which observed an excess cancer risk for stomach, lung, and bladder cancer. And one, a recent entrance, which only had people from 1983 onwards, which didn't observe an effect of, of, of any of these cancers, but did observe an, accept, an excess risk of multiple myeloma. If you were to combine these two cohorts, you do have, in fact, three populations to study. People working before 1982, people working after 1982, and a group crossing that. Um, and given that exposures have gone down, um, with, with say, uh, well, depending on where in the factory people work, with between zero and 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 eighteen percent per year, um, there are clear 
uh, you can analyze this as the cause. You can also analyze these as pre post changes in exposure rather than, for example, looking at cumulative exposure variation. And that may prove, may provide clearer contrasts for causal inference um, and, for, and possibly for, for policy making as a result. There is, however, a, another contrast of interest, and that is um, that related to beta naphthalamine, um, which, uh, which is a, a bladder cancer. Um, carcinogen, and because you have these, you have that first cohort where people worked uh, workers from well before 1952 to well after. Um, you can you can use the fact that in 1952, naphthalamine was was prohibited for manufacturing and for use in the UK as a uh, as a specific time point where a policy changed, and you can look at the workers working before and after and possibly across that and use the same methodologies that, that we've seen for the other. Uh, so, so regression discontinuity uh, designs that we've seen for other factors. So if I may, I've got a little bit at the end that I would like to flag now that we've, um, we know what natural experiment evaluations are and, and why we can use them. And that is, if we go back to the start of the presentation, what is it that we really want? And what we want is, we want to aim, well, we want to investigate the effect of an intervention or a change, or and that's kind of what an RCT does. Um, we make a distinction between exposed and unexposed, which is also like an RCT. So basically, what we're trying to do is we try to emulate a trial and and can we use the idea of a trial emulation for, um, for natural experiment evaluations? And we can, and we can do that based on something called a target trial framework, which is, is um, developed by uh, Hernan um, from, from Harvard University. And it's an idea where you divide the protocol of, 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 a, of a trial or of a target trial along uh, three components common to RCTs, and, and I won't go into all of these, but they invo involve things like eligibility criteria, the follow-up period, outcomes, assignment procedures, etc. And you can use that to design better trials in the design, better natural experiment evaluations in the design phase to see where they differ from uh, RCTs and where you can make things better and where you have to make concessions. And you can report and you can use it for reporting and appraising in such a way that um, you get better reporting and understanding of, of the actual evaluations. This is from that same paper that I wrote that I mentioned earlier, and it, it goes through all of these concepts um, in relation to um, natural experiment evaluations and how you can strengthen causal claims. And, and this is one example for eligibility criteria. Um, where it tells you how you theorize the causal contrast of this and then how you strengthen their, their claims. And if this is something you're interested in this area, then, then I would very much recommend to, to read the paper and have a look at the, the table that's in it. So that results in the main recommendations from that paper for, for uh, natural experiment evaluation. It's to use multiple control groups or conditions. And in red, it tells you which which of the factors of the target trial that addresses. It's to, as, to assess pre-intervention changes. Can, can you expect those? To include positive and negative control outcomes as well as the one of interest. And conduct a lot of falsification or validation tests um, just to make sure that you're absolutely sure what you're evaluating is related to the, the thing you're trying to test. If we go back to the SICA evaluation of the alcohol health champions, we use different controls and different study designs, and you can see them in the two figures. Um, and what you see is that they're actually, they differ quite a bit depending on the controls and the, and the analytic method. And sometimes they even have opposite controls, such as for antisocial, or opposite results, such as for antisocial behavior incidents. So it's very important that if you can use multiple controls and methods that you use these to improve your causal inference. If we look at pre-intervention anticipation, this is the uh, changes in the soft drink, uh, uh, in the soft drink levy that was 
implemented in the, in, in the UK a couple of years ago. Um, and the idea was, um, if you if if there's a um, an extra cost on on, um, on soft drinks, depending on how much sugar is in them, will that make people drink less? And and this was evaluated through interrupted time series, and the result was that in fact it didn't do anything in terms of of consumption. Um, but having looked at it a little bit more, was there any anticipation of the intervention? It turned out that industry had changed the amount of sugar in drinks to 10% lower per household. So, so overall, the intervention worked, but not in the results that was in the way that was initially um, thought of. And then validation tests, there's two kind of tests to do. Temporal validation is, is does the same thing happens with the same intervention? And this is data of pesticides and suicide uh, um, risk and in Sri Lanka. And every time a ban of pesticides was introduced for various specific pesticides or for class one pesticides, specifically, you see a drop in, um, in the effect. And after the first one, you see that some replacement effects of different pesticides. But after all class ones were banned, you see a reduction. So every time there was a reduction after a new ban tells you that there is, in all likelihood, a, a strong a causal effect uh, uh, between suicide risk and, and um, pesticide use. The spatial val validation is, does the same thing happen if, it, if, if the same kind of policy is, is introduced somewhere else? And you see that when they do the same study in South Korea, um, um, where there was a cancellation of paraquat re-registration, uh, re uh, re you see a drop in suicides as well. So showing that the same thing happens somewhere else and this tells you that there's probably a cause and effect. And falsification test lastly is, in this case, we have the data to look at a specific time point. What if we artificially move the time point to six months earlier, six points later? Um, at that time point, we saw an, we saw an impact of, of a particular intervention. Um, in this case, the closure of a, of a venue on um, antisocial behavior. If you move that time point, then you, you don't see an impact anymore. It tells you that it's specific to that time point. And if you use different areas, as intervention areas and artificially program that, you also see that there's no effect uh, anymore of the initial thing, telling you that what you're investigating is very specific to the time and the area of, of interest. And that gives you extra confidence that that your result is, is correct. So that's the end of my presentation. Take home messages are basically that natural experiment evaluations have strength and limitations. Um, that they're better in terms of causality, at least in principle, than various observational studies. But you don't control the randomization, so it's still not an RCT, so there's always things to keep in mind and to check. That the target trial framework provides a systematic method for designing and evaluating them. But specifically, I think for this, that natural experiment evaluations are used in environmental and occupational epidemiology, but not as much as I think they probably should be used. Um, and then an op a lot of opportunities for improving causal inference to inform environmental policy are, are, are missed that way. And, and I hope by doing this presentation that, that um, more of you will consider these kind of designs and step out of the, the standard um, study designs to, uh, to make inferences about the effects of environmental uh, pollutants. Thank you very much. That's that's all I had to say. I apologize that it was longer than expected, but hopefully there's still some time for question and, and discussions. Thank you, Professor Devot. Now we so we uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so I would encourage our audience to uh, type your questions in the question box if you have any. I, I will jump with the, with the question uh, right away if I could. Uh, Frank, you're talking about, to what extent do you think? Uh, observational happy data can be uh, reframed or reinterpreted using this natural experiment framework. I mean, you draw analogies with rubber manufacturing industry where if I am hearing right, you're saying you can take all this information you have and just look at it differently and get more useful answers 
Uh, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, yeah I, I, yes. If you find the right examples, I think that that's very much that I think it's it's a mistake, and I probably should have said that to think that wherever there's data, there's a natural experiment evaluation waiting to be to be discovered. I don't think that's the case at all. But there are certain certain situations where that is the case and where we don't use it. And that was my conceptual illustration of the rubber cohorts. That is it possible to look at this in another way than we've than, than we traditionally do and see if we can get more out of the data and especially stronger causal conclusion conclusions out of our data that 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 can that, that gives you stronger evidence to influence policy and to make people who don't want to budge budge on so on certain things okay, thank you i don't see any, i don't see any questions uh up yet uh but maybe i could kind of go on off of that uh, you, you may have heard just recently there was a, a derailment in uh, in uh, in Ohio of a train basically, and it released a lot of burning uh, vinyl chloride, uh, potential carcin or carcinogen, uh, burning dioxin, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of issues potentially people are considering about that and long term health effects. How might uh, something like, uh, I mean, that's maybe similar to the earthquake situation, uh, et cetera, you described in Christchurch. Uh, how might that be considered a natural experiment and how might that, for example, be looked at? I, I guess I'll just say, to add to that one question I would have would be, it may be the folks who are exposed are gonna be more likely to go to physicians uh, with, with uh, and, and I mean, there, I, I guess it's the, uh, the, the, the bias that, well, I forget there's a name for it, but the bias, of associated with uh, uh, kind of looking more closely or more carefully on that. Any thoughts about that being a natural experiment? Would that be a useful thing potentially to do? Or I think so. It's it's very much mimics the example of the the the, the fact the TCDD ex, uh, exposure yep. Yep. in the uh, yep. in in Italy. It's the same kind of event. So you have these. You could think about these kind of zones around it. Uh, and, and I'm not familiar with the geography and or the populations there. So um before that accident happened presumably there was very little exposure um which the post only design in a way is the, is the least strong of the um natural experiment evaluation because it, it there's no data before the the um, the accident but you can make reasonable assumptions like in the italian study i think the same goes goes here and if you if you look at Given that it's it's a carcinogen, you'd have to look at quite a long time. So so there is definitely room for for a a control group there, um, elsewhere that tells you about changes in background rates in particular cancers that would have happened not related to that at all. So that creates in a way a bit of a difference in differences or type to type design and and I think rather than for just follow a cohort which i think should be done anyway it you could combine that with like a, these kind of control groups to see if you can if you can get a more more precise more accurate estimate okay okay and, and use maybe different some different techniques for example mm -hmm. on that yeah. over time okay thank you well thank you frank it definitely sounds like it, you know, you're encouraging people to be opportunistic and be creative about what questions they ask and try to morph it and map how far away what ideal is from what is uh, what is available. I think just yes, keeping in mind that for those people who are keen on randomized controlled trials, uh, there's a fantastic paper about randomized controlled trials for parachutes, uh, which is uh, which dates me, I think, because I know it. Uh, but it's, it's the not always the Christmas end. issue, I think. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I'm sure you're all familiar yeah. with it. It's, a, it's not always the answer, and we all know it, but sometimes in the heat of the moment, we forget that there's not everything is about RTC. Mm. So thank you for reminding us about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could do, can I ask a question on that? Uh, I don't, don't see any questions in the box yet, uh, but 
one of the things, how much are these regarded as uh, as causal in the sense that when they do come out, uh, do most people kind of uh, accept them more than basically the some of the more standard designs, case control and cohort or so, or uh, uh, in terms of causality and, and just the general acceptance of them uh, with respect to demonstrating causality? My general impression is yes, yes, they do. It depends a bit on well on a variety of, of factors, but but one of the strengths of using these designs that you is that you can put in loads of falsification tests, mm -hmm. validation tests, and I, I mentioned I showed some of some of those at the latter bit of my my presentation. And generally, when you have a result from about the impact of of something. Mm -hmm. um, Analyze is a natural experiment, and you have and you, and you have a very good case for as if randomization, and you put quite a bit of validation and um, sensitivity type analysis in. Really, then then that's generally speaking, at least in public health world, it's very well received. Okay. I think I think we, also in public health world because there's a lot of medical doctors and, and medical. I don't want to generalize, but tend to learn about lots of different epidemiological study designs and only remember the last one, uh, the RCT, when they leave medical school. So mm -hmm. because this is closer to an RCT, it tends to go down a bit better. Okay. Uh, and, and maybe a really quick follow-up, because I don't see any questions. Uh, uh, fluoridation in water in US, I think it's something like 70%. Uh, there are communities basically that are using fluoride in their water, introducing it. Uh, there's some question uh, about cognitive development, for example, of kids. Uh, but there's also so, the, but there's communities that decide they're going to stop, uh, and neighboring communities that continue on. Uh, it, would that seem to you? And you talked a little bit about fluoridation. Would that seem to be you, uh, and also a, a good opportunity for uh, a, 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 as a, a natural experiment, or a good opportunity for a kind of better looking at that, basically getting. I think that's a brilliant opportunity for a natural experiment evaluation, especially if these things are still being brought in or removed, because you can collect pre-intervention data at area level, yep. and you've got natural control areas where it doesn't, or they okay. stop doing it. Yeah. And the pre-intervention might be uh, kids' scores on uh, intelligence tests or, or whatever, or standardized tests and uh, when they're six or seven years old, first or second grade or something like that. Yeah. And there, there'd be lots of that, I think, probably. So, okay, great, thanks. So I know we're a little bit over, but maybe we can give a chance to, uh, we have a question that just popped up um, yeah, about um, the importance of uh, parallel trends assumption in general for, nat uh, in, for natural experiments, if you could touch on that. What is the, I can't see the question. <laughs> so. okay. Okay, so, so you, you you will not see it, Frank, but the question from the audience is, uh, can you please touch upon the importance of parallel trends assumption? Oh, sorry, yes. So, so, so the reason that that's important is it, you, want, you want to have some confidence that before the intervention happened, the whatever happened over time in your intervention and control areas, it's easiest to understand it like that, you want to know that they are driven by the same factors, whatever the trend is. So you want those timelines to be more or less the same, because if one of them looks completely different than the other, then then they're not, then the outcome isn't driven by the same factors. And if one of them then changes, say the intervention area, you can't be 100% sure that it was the intervention, because it could be something else that happened, and you don't know what it is. So so, so the idea is if before the intervention, the response looks the same over time in in, um, in intervention and control areas, they would have looked the same afterwards had the intervention not happened. So any difference is then, you can then interpret as being the result of the intervention. Thank you, it's just easier to see. I mean, there's gonna be many caveats there, but thank you very much. It's very helpful.
All right, thank you. So just to respect everyone's time, uh, I think we should probably end here. Uh, it's 12.07. So I want to thank you, Professor Devot, for your time and for a great presentation. And thank you uh, to our audience for joining us today. So once again, the recording will be available on our website. We, there will also be a follow-up email with um, a link to the recording for this webinar. And if you have any questions or feedback, uh, you would like to propose some speakers, feel free to contact me and um, stay in touch for our next webinar that will happen in the next few months. So thanks everyone and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye again. Thank Bye. you very much, Frank, for taking time.